All right, everyone. Um, I think let's kick it off. Uh, welcome to the second Babylon monthly meetup. Super excited. The first one was a smashing success. Expect this one will be as well, and everyone hereafter. Um, for those that are new, uh, Babylon JS is an open source web development framework for creating beautiful performant experiences that run in the browser or even as native applications if you want to dive deep. This meeting itself is inside of a tool made with Babylon JS, so you can get a sense of its power and capabilities. This tool is Frame, uh, by the way. Um, a few little sort of ground rules. First of all, if things seem messed up, a golden rule is just refresh the turn it off and on again. But we'd appreciate it if you gave us a little note in the text chat about whatever it is that you're experiencing. Oh, I, I lost the screen share. Uh, that just helps us kind of keep things better for the next time as we learn about issues and, and fix them. But then uh, after things are messed up, uh, just try a refresh and, and see if that sorts things out. There will be a bit of time after each speaker for questions. So you can save your questions for then. But if you've got a question and you want to just put it in the text chat during the presentation itself, you're welcome to. It's up to the speaker to decide if they want to uh, address that question immediately or wait until right. after their presentation and then uh, loop back to it. And you can get the next meetup on your calendar with the usual, uh, the usual link, which I'll put in the in the text chat. Again, uh, it's going to be the fifteenth of each month at nine a.m. Just to keep it easy, I believe next month that's a Sunday. I hope that's okay. But if there's a rebellion about that, uh, I'm open to to changing it. And I do want to say, we are going to start like kind of leveling up our space itself that we hold these meetings in. Uh, this is a cool uh, frame. It's good for a lot of reasons. It's it's really good for performance and a few other things, but we want to kind of take things to the next level to really make a space that shows off some of the other things that Babylon is capable of. Uh, these are things that many of us are, it's just second nature to us, you know, shaders and particle systems and this and that. But we've seen that some uh, beginners kind of come to this meetup and I, I really love the idea, and Jason, we were chatting about this after the last one. I love the idea of making this space so that after the, uh, after the meetup, people can kind of walk around and just learn more about Babylon just by walking around the space and exploring. So to help sort of supercharge this, we're actually going to be running some contests. Uh, specifically, the first one's going to be around shader creation. So we're going to have a few shaders in the space. And we're going to open up to the whole Babylon community to uh, like submit some shaders, uh, which you can save as little snippets. And then uh, we can bring those shaders into the meetup space. And we'll pick a shader or two as like our favorite shader and uh, give some kind of reward as well. More details on this coming. But would really love it if uh, people got excited and engaged and enthusiastic about making some really cool shaders that we can uh, include in this Babylon meetup space. All right, I have done my spiel and we have a very cool agenda today. Uh, first, it's gonna be uh, Andy from the Frame team talking about off-screen rendering uh, for intensive operations. We've got Joseph talking about uh, Canvatorium, some really cool experiments with Babylon GUI that he's been doing for a while now. I think he's a real Babylon GUI wizard. And then finally, from the Babylon team itself, we've got Carol talking about the flow graph, which is a new uh, interactivity engine for Babylon. All right, I am taking my place in the seats. And Andy, could you come up and kick us off? And speakers, make sure that you have your megaphone on, uh, which is the button right next to the microphone. It'll make sure that you're heard by everyone, even if they're far away. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, well, first off, hello, everybody. I haven't really practiced this presentation, so you'll have to bear with me. Uh, I'm going to be going over kind of just some simple concepts that I'm sure quite a few of you are pretty familiar with already, but we're just going to give a general abstraction over that um, and then go over some use cases for when or when not to use an off-screen rendering canvas. <laughs> Thank you, Delta. <laughs> uh, but 
Uh, first, yeah, again, hi everybody, and let's see here. Let's actually share screen if I can get. Oh my gosh, I keep hitting that, moving that. Sorry if that keeps moving. I need to not be in edit mode. How do I stop sharing? Uh, there should be a little button at the top left of the screen, like a little. X. There you go. Yeah. Oh my god, each time. And I you gotta. Goes into edit yeah, mode. you're in edit mode frenzy. You got to keep edit mode off. I have it turned off whenever I click to interact with it. It's put me back in edit mode. All right, there we go. Share screen. Here we go. Window. Boom. So a nice little dainty flow chart for you guys. Uh, just kind of going over the way that you would kind of think about how you're going to set up your app when you're doing any sort of uh, web worker off screen rendering context. Uh, you basically have your main thread, which lives in a separate context from your worker thread. Any type of communication that you need to do between the two, I generally like to set up where you have a either a worker manager or a rendering manager that is the main entrance point for the communications. It's kind of the same idea as if you were doing web sockets or anything like that where you have to actually post messages, listen to the response messages in order to get any sort of interaction between the contexts. Um, the main application, generally everybody knows what the main application is for, and that's going to spin up any of your manager classes or any of the things that's actually running your application. I generally like to have inside my application manager a rendering manager, which is specifically responsible for creating the main scene that you're going to be rendering. Uh, if you are going to be using the off-screen canvas as your output, you also probably you know, spin that up on the main thread and then you pass that over with a uh, message to your worker thread. Um, the rendering manager should be listening for any sort of uh, messages coming from your worker manager or possibly from your worker itself, depending on how you set up your app. Um, but generally, I try to separate the communication between the worker thread and the the rendering manager I kind of want things to live and do their own thing uh, so it's usually what would spin up the worker manager class so that way it has direct communication between between the two uh, the worker manager is generally going to be responsible for initializing your worker passing the, uh, the off-screen canvas to that worker thread so that way you can actually get the context back from the worker uh, it's going to be responsible for any of your messaging between the two contexts uh, and also sends the updates back to the, the, the main thread, so your main application or your rendering manager. Uh, usually I use the worker manager as the only port of entry to communicate with the worker just to kind of keep your flow simple. Anything that's on the main thread that needs to actually send something or communicate to the worker should probably step through the worker manager and have the worker manager post the message to, to that worker. Um, with the, the main thread, you also have an off-screen canvas. Depending on what you are doing with your off-screen rendering, you might not ever even need to display the off-screen canvas. It, it, it's a question on whether or not you need to do that. If you have to have your, off, your, your worker thread doing anything that is manipulating Babylon context or have some sort of WebGL uh, interactions whatsoever, you probably... You, you want to have that spun up. You don't. It's not necessary because you can also spin up the the worker or the off-screen canvas inside the worker. It's just you won't have the ability to directly render that canvas then to the client. You would have to do an extra step of passing a buffer back from the worker to your worker manager and then displaying that some sort of way. Otherwise, you could just inherently display the canvas that you spun up on the main thread and that will get the context updates from, from your worker. Uh, on the, the worker side, you have you know just your worker, which is going to be listening for any signals from your worker manager. It's also going to be responsible for initializing your intensive operations. Um, generally speaking, if you, you can spin up your, your engine and your scene on a separate class, but since the worker is generally going to be responsible for handling the messages back and forth, it is good to kind of have your, your new engine and your new scene class living in that context. Um, and then, of course, any sort of intensive operations that have any sort of high impact on your CPU, 
should be spun up uh, separately from that. Um, and then they should have some sort of way to communicate your intensive operations in your worker. Generally, what I would do is I set up observables on my worker and subscribe or I set up observables on my intensive operation, and then I have my worker subscribe to those observables, then handling any post messages once those observables are uh, triggered. Uh, a lot of the best use case scenarios for doing any of this off-screen rendering will be when you have an extremely high, C, uh, high intensity CPU scene that doesn't require any sort of user input. Uh, the reason why you don't generally do the user input is because you have to actually handle each one of those interactions in a po uh, message posted to the worker, process that, handle it any sort of way. So it does add complexity. It's not not doable. You can actually, in fact, I'll show an example of handling ca uh, camera communication between the main thread and the worker thread. But generally, it's it's for, for more high intensity, less interaction type things. Um, it also works really well for if you need any sort of Babylon context serialized or any sort of high intensity things compiled that you then want to pass maybe those buffers back over to the main context. That's an interesting use case that you can also use for caching assets uh, amongst other things. Um, or maybe even you just want to capture a, a screenshot of a separate scene and pass that back to the, the main thread uh, without having that impact any of the things you're doing in your main scene. Uh, some of the fringe cases is actually one that I'll demonstrate here after uh, this uh, read through is to actually capture the render target and pass that back to your main context using that as a, a dynamic texture or a raw texture that's continually being updated from the worker thread, which you can create kind of, you know, portals into other scenes or other other tools in your, your main context. Um, and again, a French use case is when it is highly CPU intensive, but you have simple inputs to support. It just does add to the complexity. Um, then again, there are times to just use a web worker. The, the off-screen canvas rendering is going to be mainly when you really need to actually render something that is not being taking up any of your main threads uh, CPU. It, prevents any sort of locking on the main thread and is just generally for visual type stuff. But if you were doing something like, let's say, entities that needed nav mesh, you could spin up your whole recast setup on the worker thread um, and do the navigation that way, which would need the WebGL context. So that wouldn't really be a good example. But let's say you had just a 2D voxelized plane and you wanted to control the pathfinding that way and then pass the results back to your to your main scene. You wouldn't really need an off-screen canvas. Uh, anytime you're just doing any sort of modulation of data that doesn't require any sort of Babylon context or WebGL scope or anything like that, you can, you can just stick to a web worker. You don't necessarily need to do an off-screen canvas for that unless, you know, you need the render loop for some reason. Um, for example here, what we have done is we have gone through and made a tool where I'm not sure if any of you guys are familiar with Babylon 3D tiles or not, or not Babylon, uh, Google 3D tiles. We went ahead and took Play Canvas's parser that they had for that and ported it over to Babylon and started making a tool here where you can go to pretty much anywhere in the world and export a model from that. So here I dropped in. I'm right in the uh, center of San Francisco right now. And if I was to fly around, you'll see right here the loading model count is going to shoot up intensely. Um, if this is on the main thread, which you see it kind of freezing up there, even though it's freezing up on this thread, I'm still able to move and navigate no problem on the main thread. So even though this is loading hundreds and hundreds of models and taking quite a huge memory reservation, it, it does impact the main thread. Um, Anybody got a, a place we want to go to real quick? Somebody give me somewhere. Anybody? Rome. All right. Let's go to, oh, let's go to Vatican, uh, Vatican City now. Find location. So right here, you know, I'm loading 400 some models. 
that I know it's not Rome. It's close enough. It's it's the neighbor to Rome. Oh, I'm actually in the world here, so my my altitude algorithm there uh, kind of slipped up a little bit. But we'll zoom out of the zoom out of the planet here and start looking around. Looks like we're uh, we're in Rome here. So and this extends all the way to the Earth uh, to the planetary level. So we can go way far out into space and load all the way in pretty much with no hangs uh, whatsoever on on the main thread side. Um, and then once we decide that we really want to, our pi our flow here is I'll have to do is hit export model and it will step out a certain number of levels of nodes of the octree out, dispose all of the rest, to kind of limit the scope of what the model is that's being exported. And you can export pretty much anything straight into your frame context. Um, and you want to go ahead and switch me over here, Gabe. So as you can see in the background here, we got the Eiffel Tower for our uh, French-speaking people. And that was exported straight out of the Google 3D tiles and then ran through an optimizer and imported into the scene all with just one click. So didn't cause any main, main thread hang, just was able to go right off the bat. Uh, it's a pretty cool thing to do. This is, you know, this was a pretty good, pretty specific use case. Um, if you actually look at here, though, as well, any of this movement that I'm doing on the camera, you're actually, I'm having to actually pass all of the, that information over to the worker thread. So this normal, normally being able to navigate in through this and do any sort of these mouse interactions is not possible until you teach it to be possible. So it's not it's not the worst thing in the world. You just have to know how to communicate that information. So uh, that is about it. So hopefully that gives you some ideas of what you can do with off-screen rendering and when you should use it versus using just regular workers. Epic. Uh, super epic. <laughs> That was amazing, and I uh, love that we linked up to uh, get that epic model in there. Um, yeah, really cool, and very very neat technique that uh, like we're going to be using a lot just because of how powerful it is. And this example where Andy's been working on this feature for us for a couple weeks now is really just one example, I think, of how we're going to be doing it. Uh, it's a perfect one to showcase here because it kind of fits all the checkboxes that I think Andy outlined of like when, when you might really want to use uh, this particular feature. Any questions for Andy? Silence is good. It means I explained myself well. Yes. <laughs> well, thank you, y'all. And I will step down for the next person then. Cool. Amazing. All righty. Next up, we've got Joseph uh, talking about Canvatorium and Babylon GUI stuff. Hello, everyone. Hello, hello. All right. Let me push a couple buttons. Hey, everyone. So my name is Joseph. I am a generalist developer. And I do a lot of business consulting for small businesses. Um, and I do this long-term side project called Camatorium, which is basically my way of being able to kind of share what I'm doing and what I'm learning. Um, because a lot of the consulting work I do, I don't really get to share any of that. A lot of it's behind NDAs and um not stuff I get to take credit for publicly. So I will do a lot of prototyping and proof of concept work in Canvatorium before I implement something for my customers. It's just kind of a way of like, I still want to share what I'm learning and show off a little bit and things like that. So that is kind of the gist of what Canvatorium is. Let me see, cancel that. Yeah, to um to close the webcam stream, there's a little button at the top left of the screen, like a little red X of, of the of the streaming screen, and that's oh, should... it. There you go. Perfect. 
All right, so let's flip over to, so yeah, like I said, I'm Joseph. Um, you can find me VR Hermit in most places. I'm on GitHub and the Babylon JS community at Radical App Dev. And I also have a links page at vrhermit.com slash links. So like I said, Camatorium is just my long-term side project. Um, most of the work I'm doing of, in, involves VR, AR, spatial computing, whichever buzzword of the week you want to use. I like the term spatial computing. Uh, I first learned about that from the Voices of VR podcast a couple of years ago and thought that was a good term. Um, so I'm a big proponent of learning in public as a way of kind of keeping myself accountable to making progress and also sharing what I'm learning along the way. So that's why I decided to start doing Camatorium uh, as kind of a, a long-term project. So Camatorium is essentially broken up into small bite-sized labs where I can take one idea or concept and just tinker with it and build something with it. Um, there's a little bit of shared code between the labs just to have something, some you know, basic scaffolding for the project. Um, but for the most part, each lab is atomic. And the code is often quite messy. I, I don't generally refactor anything. Um, most of the time, the point is just to build the proof of concept or test the idea and see, can I do this thing? And then once I figured out how to do it in Camatorium, then I go implement it in another project from there. So all of the code is available on GitHub. Um, just search for Radical Camatorium online and you'll find the repo. There's also a landing page on my website and this has a link to all of the scenes. I've got some feature labs up at the top, um, kind of a running list of scenes here. And you can kind of click on each of these and they are embedded in an iframe on this site. So you can play with them here directly and you can also open them in a new tab. Um, so like I said, most of these are WebXR scenes. Um, that's where most of my interest lies. But uh, Babylon.js has a lot of features that work really well, particularly the input system that work well using a mouse or a touch screen or the input system in WebXR, which is one of the things that really drew me to Babylon.js over 3JS or A-Frame or Play Canvas is that you can build a lot without having to jump into the headset for every single little change and test. Um, so let me highlight a couple of things, in particular that Babylon JS brings to the table for WebXR development. Um, the input system that I mentioned, the the fact that you get controller and hand tracking support out of the box, and it's very well documented and really easy to figure out and also locomotion. It's got a teleport module built in. It's also got movement-based uh, locomotion. And then some of the powerhouse features, particularly for WebXR, is the 2D GUI built on the advanced dynamic texture, which you can build some pretty cool stuff with. The 3D GUI features for doing uh, layouts, for kind of laying out 3D objects in space and interacting with them. And then some of my favorites, the mesh behaviors. Uh, some of these things, they're not necessarily made specifically for WebXR, but they seem like magic in WebXR, like the surface magnetism behavior or the uh, six off drag behavior, just make anything draggable and movable or the follow behavior. So these features here, you can build a lot in WebXR um, just with these handful of things. So let's look at a couple of demos. So this is the kind of the old version of Camatorium. I'm no longer maintaining this one, but I haven't ported this demo to the new version yet. Uh, but this was playing around with a, making a GUI configuration screen for the WebXR locomotion uh, settings. So I've got a teleport mode where I can switch it to movement mode. Um, I can adjust a few things on the teleport and adjust a few of the settings on the movements and I can save all of these and they would update my lab player, my lab kind of XR player in any of the other labs. So I could come to this lab in particular, set my locomotion just the way I want and then any lab that I use in the rest of the project would have those locomotion settings. So this one's kind of hard to demo in uh, on my laptop because all these settings work in WebXR, but uh, yeah, so we'll just skip to the next one. Um, 
the next thing to show off is a series of labs that I've done recently towards the end of the summer, just building some different 2D windowing uh, concepts. So this one is just a main window. It's got kind of a parent object that you can use to drag it around, um, some buttons to toggle through some records, just some sample data that I made with ChatGPT. And I used this as kind of the basis for this series. So in lab 47, we took the same window and there is a button attached to the middle text area that just opens a modal kind of right in front of that um, and just transitions that other window back a little bit and animates it back and forth. Uh, just a really simple modal and a replace. So you're using the same thing to just replace the current window with a back button. In lab 48, lab 49, uh, this has a detail screen. So it just pops up at the, at the side here. So we can just toggle this open and close. And then lab 50, we've got, this is actually one of those uh, 3D GUI things. This is the plane layout. Uh, and we can click on one of these and go back. Well, maybe go back. Apparently my back button is broken. But uh, yeah, that uh, that should work. But this is what, oh, there it is. It's just a little too high for some reason. I must have something blocking that on the canvas. But yeah, the, the same kind of parent object that can move the grid around will also move the card around. Uh, so you can kind of think of these as like window grouping elements. And then I've got a version of this um, for AR as well. So a lot of these scenes on the Camatorium website, um, they have an interactive 3D scene at the top, maybe a little bit of notes or descriptions about anything interesting about the lab. And most of the time I have a video demo at the bottom as well, if you want to check out sort of, like if you don't have a headset handy. Um, and I think the one that I was working on today, one, one of my favorites that I've done so far is this, um, kind of lathe concept, like a lathe modeling tool. So using the mesh builder create lathe function uh, in con combination with the Babylon JS GUI and just a few uh, drag behaviors on these objects, we can create some pretty cool stuff. So I can drag these points around and then hit build shape and it creates an object using that outline. So all I'm doing with these spheres is uh, just creating an array of vectors to use for the lathe. I can reset that and try a number of different shapes. Um, you can tell this one in particular was meant for WebXR, not for the mouse. But uh, can do some pretty cool stuff with it. So like I said, the everything that I've done here is pure implementation. Um, there's nothing that I've done in Camatorium that isn't built into Babylon JS and that anybody else can go do. So a lot of it is just trying to figure out how, how do I do this in Babylon JS or can I do this or what feature do I need to achieve this outcome and then just go kind of build it from there. So yeah, that's Camatorium in a nutshell, just a side project. Really cool. And I encourage everyone to follow Joseph uh, so you can stay abreast of his uh, epic experiments here and I'll I think I got your handle right, uh, Joseph, there in the chat. Correct me if I, mm -hmm. if I didn't. Yep. Um, any, uh, any questions for uh, Joseph? Is there any plans to make those uh, elements, the UI elements, kind of a, uh, just a library that we can include and use those elements quickly? Um, not in the short term. Most of them are so simple that they're kind of... It's already easy to do that. So you can kind of dig around the code and see how they're implemented. Uh, I may come up with some kind of, um, so I don't want to do it necessarily like an abstract UI library, because I think that's a bit beyond my scope, but something along a specific theme. So um, where all the components look the same and maybe you can adjust the fonts and colors, something like that, I may do that eventually. Um, yeah, I know there's been too many things to work on.
Hey, this is Dan from the Frame Team. Just curious if you use the GUI editor at all in your uh, in your UI design, or if you just did it from scratch. So I did it all in code. Uh, mm -hmm. I played around with the GUI editor when it was in beta, and then I kind of forgot about it. So I, I need to go back to it. Um, but yeah, I've just done all of this in code for now. Gotcha. Thank you. All right. Well, uh, you know where to find them if you have a follow-up question. And really appreciate you taking the time here, Joseph, to uh, take us through that. Thanks for having me. All right. Next up, we have Carol from the Babylon team talking to us about Flowgraph, a new interactivity engine for Babylon. And we are very grateful to, uh, to have her. Over to you, Carol. Hmm. Where is Carol? <laughs> uh, is she not here? That's a good question. Um, was she muted? Are you secretly hiding and muted, Carol? Carol, are you here? She's shy, maybe. <laughs> maybe. You guys might know where to find her. Can you ping her anywhere? Yep. We are trying it. as we speak. But okay. Yeah. Cool. We are trying. <laughs> Oh, sorry, I forgot. <laughs> In the meantime, does Jason have any more dad jokes? Oh, do I no, have? Who asked for that? I think your name. Don't do make really... me show you every lab in Camden. Jason, <laughs> maybe use your your the, the notes now, and then we don't have to hear them on Monday. No, sorry, we don't get out of stand up jokes. Oh man. Or it's a megaphone. Anyone? A stick. <laughs> oof. <laughs> oof. Oof is the appropriate Jeez. response for sure. Yeah. Um, what's red and smells like blue paint? Uh, red paint. Mm. Gosh. I was offering the option to do a AMA if Carol cannot this come is, back. Yeah, you can pick between an Ask Me Anything with Delta Kosh or <laughs> Dad Jokes with Pirate JC. It's your choice. Uh, no offense either way. Uh, you can vote in the chat starting now. Uh, did you hear about the corduroy pillow? No? It's been making headlines. Oh, God. <laughs> Someone this asked is, for it, right? So that person. This is, is what we've de this is what we've degraded <laughs> into here, people. <laughs> All right, Delta Kosh, get on up here. So Canvatorium, that that thing's pretty cool. <laughs> I was I was really digging that. Honestly, that's very uh, very great. I'm glad someone's tackling UI like that. Thank you. If you if anybody has any ideas that they want me to test and in UI or in WebXR, just feel free to send them to me. I I, uh, I may be in touch. I have some ideas. <laughs> cool. Uh, Delta, maybe should we um, for Carol? Should we? Because I'm, I'm I know we got some people in the crowd that are very interested in this in this topic. Uh, are you able to speak to it here, or should we just wait for next month and have Carol present then? Okay. Apparently, uh, what we've learned this week is that lightning strikes sometimes in Brazil and just kills the internet service providers. Isn't that yep. true, Sergio? Yeah. Right. yeah. Um, we could maybe just talk very high level for a moment, David, just uh, about the concept of kind of interactivity. And I, forgive me if you all know this, but um, the Kronos Group is. Yeah, yeah. So just very, very high level, the um, Kronos group is currently looking at a new GLTF extension that I believe is called uh, Interactivity. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong, Ronan. You or, are correct. There. 
Okay. Ooh. And interactivity is the idea of, at the highest level, it's the idea of logic traveling with a 3D asset. And so the, the example to that is, let's say that there's a, a door, like a, just a, a kitchen door type of a thing. If you click on the handle, the doorknob or the door handle, then that will trigger an animation to play of the door opening. That logic, though very, very simple, right now is required to exist inside of each individual engine. So if you were to go build something in Unity or build something in Babylon or take something into a 3D viewer application of any kind, then uh, that logic is specific to the engine. What the Kronos Group is interested in proposing is this idea that that base level, very simple logic will uh, travel with the 3D asset. So it can be authored in a number of places and then and then basically travel to any given 3D viewer engine, whatever it may be, which is a really, really cool idea. So the, the logic around assets can travel now for the first time. Um, that is in final kind of negotiation. The, the spec is supposed to be released on GitHub either this week or next week, pretty soon, I believe. Um, and so the, what, what we're working on, and we'll, we'll save this a little bit, but on the Babylon team, we're looking at base level support for this so that you can import GLTF objects that have um, interactivity and, and have logic embedded inside of the GLB file, and that will fully work inside of Babylon. So we're actively developing right, that right now. It's called Flowgraph, and Carol's going to walk you through a bit of that uh, maybe next meetup. And then uh, we have some, uh, some vision around it to not just accept or import that logic, but also to use some of our node-based systems to allow you to edit or create uh, that, that same type of miniature logic for assets as well. So that's the high-level space that we're looking at, a little bit about the roadmap, and Carol is the one who's architecting that out uh, along with Ronan uh, for, for Babylon, and that'll probably, we'll, she'll give you a look at kind of how that's developing because we're actively working on that right now. David, anything else to add? Uh, David, turn your you megaphone on. Fun. Sorry about that, Gabe. Yes. It's all good. Quick, quick question about that. What kind of code, like, are you going to be able to do custom code, or is it going to be a very specific, like, set of coding that you can do on it? Because what about, like, security concerns? So initially, we want to have the support for the GLTF interactivity at the bare minimum, right? So whatever the GLTF interactive community will come with, we will have nodes to support that. But uh, yes, for instance, we plan to have a um, execute JavaScript node, right? Literally, you execute whatever you want within the system if you want to. And the, the, sorry, the initial version will also have custom events. So you will be able to trigger an event and then capture it on JavaScript and just write your own function, even so before having this block. How are they handling some of the security concerns then? Because, like, could you just load up a GLB with some sort of eval thing that's going right. so to send sensitive exist information in the, or something? This doesn't exist in the GLTF. So you have custom events in, in the, the GLTF specs. Um, it's running, if I remember correctly, it's per frame. So even if you manage to somehow get a Turing complete system, it will be very, very slow to compute things. So I, the, the, <laughs> the team understands this, the, the security issue and working on mitigating that. That's not gonna, shouldn't be an issue. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious about this because, and it's good to hear there's this sort of like event hook because thinking about how we would use this in frame, um, you know, we kind of have our own early like interaction editor where we try to let people uh, we kind of let people set up like different click events but we let them decide whether the event is local or networked and if the event is local then for example that door that opens would just open for them but if it was networked then that animation actually happens for everyone in the frame so it'd be really cool if we were able to hook into that in such a way that you know a user clicking on that door uh, like would open for 
everyone in the frame. But in order for that to happen, we'd have to, it sounds like, hook into that, um, that event, I guess. Is that making any sense? Uh, you could you could just generate your own uh, custom event defined. It's it's just a string that you will need to capture on yep. the other side, and on the other side you will have your logic. Yeah, that would be nice. the best way to solve this. So we got a hold on Carol. Uh, we are expect we are hoping she can join. She's here. Look, perfect. Hey. hey. Okay. Oh, how nice. I'm gonna the woman of the hour. Carol, come on up here. Otherwise, I'm going to tell more dad jokes. Spare us. Uh, spare, 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 spare everybody, Carol. Um, Carol, Carol is... by the way, rates my dad jokes every morning at morning stand-up, and so far, my average is zero. Valid. Thanks, Carol. <laughs> um, Carol, let's do a quick uh, sound check. Are we able to hear your microphone? I don't hear you... I don't hear you yet if you're trying to talk, so I've got a few little troubleshooting steps for you. One is, let's make sure that your browser has permission to access the microphone on this page. So if you're in Chrome, there's a little lock icon to the left of the URL bar. And uh, could you let me know in the text chat if you've got, if the site has permission to use your microphone? And the text chat's up at the top left. Let's see. Maybe Carol can't hear me. Can you hear me? Oh, I see her typing. All right. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> You're all good. Okay. You have permission. So it might just be um, the browser is accessing the wrong microphone. So what you can do is click the gear icon down in the bottom of the screen in our little toolbar. And then you'll see an audio video settings button. And if you click that, you'll see a pop-up that uh, lets you see which microphone is selected. And maybe it's the wrong one. You can change it. Sometimes that just makes things work, which is great. Sometimes when you... Oh, we've got you. Oh, great. So sorry for me being a complete noob in Ukraine. No, it's, uh, it's all good. Uh, I've seen a thousand times newbier. Uh, you're a pro as, as far as I'm concerned. So, um, Carol... In addition to having your microphone on, go ahead and click the button on the button right next to the microphone. It looks like a little megaphone, like a bullhorn. Turn oh, that on as well, and that means that everyone, even if they're far away, will be able to hear you. And okay. and then, if you'd like, you've got the uh, the streaming screen up there where you can share your screen whenever you're ready. Okay. Uh, okay. So I, I can share from here. Okay. Let me just open my presentation on PowerPoint. I'm very sorry for being late. I had a problem with uh, my food order, but we it's okay. we told them that uh, lightning struck your ISP. No, that that's only Sergius. Oh yeah, okay. Oh, lightning might have struck at, at the people who are preparing my food. I don't know. I, I just <laughs> know it never arrived. Uh, let's see if I can share. I can share my entire screen. Yep. Yes. There it is. And cool. You're seeing the presentation that I made using uh, Microsoft it. Designer. It looks beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. It's not my. It's not thanks to me. Take the credit. Okay. So, uh, who am I? I think you people usually present themselves before presenting. Oh yeah, I'm going to talk about the title, like Flow, it's something I'm working in right now for Babylon. It's the Flow Graph. It's a new interactivity engine for Babylon. And I am a member of the core Babylon JS team. I am Carol HMJ in the forums and I have a cute dog. So, uh, so um, we are going to go through the motivation, how it works what are we are going to do with it, and some examples. So the motivation. Uh, well, the main motivation is that we want to make easier for people to create interactive, interactive experiences on the web, and especially for people who aren't as used to programming. So a more simple way of interacting with 
in connecting pieces together to build the, their behavior. So one concept has been pretty popular to solve this problem. It's what the Kronos uh, people who are behind the extension are calling behavior graphs, which are a set of interlinked behavior nodes that form a graph. It's basically a bunch of complex, complicated words to say it's a bunch of uh, little nodes that connect together. And when we connect those, them together, we define a behavior. And uh, you might have seen it in Unreal Engine. It's the blueprint system that I, from what I've uh, researched, is very popular. Unity has one, Visual Scripting, and NVIDIA has their own system. Even VRChat has their own system. And one cool thing about uh, those kinds of graphs is that a lot of them support uh, users defining their own nodes. So a user can go and define a node for something like an NPC shooting at the player. And you can connect this with another node that is related to the NPC seeing the player. And then you can uh, build more complex behavior from individual blocks. So because this is being a very uh, popular uh, way of solving this interactivity problem, it became uh, started work in an official GLTF uh, extension. Then it used to be called the behavior engine, and sometimes we still call it behavior, but nowadays it's called the interactivity uh, extension. So the cool part of this being on a, a GLTF extension is that you can uh, define your experience in one engine, like maybe in the future Blender will have a, a interactivity engine extension. And then you can export that and load it on Babylon. Or you can define your experience in Babylon, export to a GLTF, GLB, and load it in Unity. It's the cool part of standards. Everybody understands each other. So because of that, we wanted to, to be on top of that extension. And we started working on the flow graph, which is our engine that is following this idea of behavior graph and the interactivity extension. And how does this engine works? Uh, before that, one important note is that we are still on an experimental stage, so things can change. They're probably going to change as we uh, more and more use it and see what works, what doesn't work. And we are also uh, waiting for GLTF to pu publish their uh, draft specification. So when that's published, there might be something different that we're going to adapt to and et cetera, et cetera. So it's a, a, an evolving work right now. So, OK, given that, how it's working right now. Currently, we have something that we call a flow graph. And it's, a, it's similar to what we have on the node material. You define a node material, and you add nodes to a node material. And now with David's node geometry, you define a node, uh, node geometry, you add nodes to the node geometry. So the flow graph follows the same idea. You define a flow graph, and you add nodes to the flow graph. Uh, one small difference between the node geometry and node material and the flow graph is that you can have different types of nodes with uh, slightly different uh, objectives. We have three main types of nodes, the data nodes, the execution nodes, and the event nodes. So what is the idea? The idea is that you start with an event node, so you're listening to a specific event, and that event can be a mesh peak or a scene start. It can be something that is defined by the user, etc. And when the event is detected, it's going to start executing the execution nodes. And the execution nodes are the sequence of behavior. So 
One example here would be uh, if a mesh is picked, we check some condition. And if the condition is true, we execute the play animation node, which is going to play an animation on a mesh. Or we execute a log node that just consoles log a message uh, uh, symbol. And those execution nodes, they can have uh, parameters. Of course, the check condition, we'll need to know, OK, what, what condition I'm checking, what Boolean I'm looking for. And to fulfill uh, these data requirements, we can use data nodes. And data nodes are nodes that uh, they are executed by demand. So whenever someone requests data of them, they are going to uh, run their function. And uh, they just provide uh, some kind of data. It can be a constant data. It can be a, some kind of random data. It can also be variables. So uh, we have the notion on a flow graph of variables that you can define and set. And you can use those variables for many things. You can change a variable uh, during the execution. You can check the value and do something with that value, etc. So uh, I hope that I'm uh, making uh, understood. But we basically have a, a, a tree of uh, nodes that is rooted on an event node and follows a, a path of execution. So uh, maybe uh, some, some of you are uh, familiar with the Scratch language, the Scratch uh, programming environment. And it's kind of similar. You connect in Scratch, you have like some blocks that you connect together and they define a behavior using those blocks. And we are doing the same thing here. So uh, these are a few more uh, details about that, like the fact that some uh, nodes can be asynchronous. So in the case of, the, for example, the play animation node, you can execute something immediately once the node runs. And you can also execute something when the animation is done. So it's similar to the notion of having a callback in a function. Uh, as I said, we also have variables. And uh, we also have a notion that we call context. A context is uh, kind of an execution context. So you can have a graph that runs different contexts, and each context has its own set of variables. So the idea of context is to promote reuse, reusability of a graph. You can define one behavior, and you let's say you can define a behavior of an NPC, and you can create a context for each NPC in your scene. So you don't have to create multiple graphs for the same behavior. Another uh, important notion is custom events. You can uh, define and send and receive custom events. Uh, we are defining an, an event by ID and event data. And this is also uh, can be very useful to uh, control the flow of your execution. So maybe uh, you here on the check condition, you play animation, and then you fire some kind of event. And then you're going to listen, maybe another graph is listening to that event, and uh, it's going to execute. It's an important part that uh, events can be uh, can share, uh, can be listened to by more than one graph. So you can have multiple graphs with the same event coordinator, and they can communicate with, with each other. They are a way of graphs communicating with each other. Um, so one thing that we want to is to make the, the kind of the interface of the blocks easy for people to uh, override and create their own blocks. So maybe they want to create a, a library of blocks that define behaviors on this, their specific game. 
So we want the, the blocks to be extendable. You can create new blocks and use them, so, uh, connect them to make your, your own behaviors. So one example would be uh, the log block. So the log block extends a graph that has an on done block and it has an it depends on some input data like a message and uh, we want the, the, it to be very simple like you just define your behavior in the execute function and you're you're done uh, and so where are we going with this uh, with this idea of flow graph so uh, the current status is a bit uh, out of date because the PR was merged already at the PR for custom events. So the next step is going to be to implement all the nodes of the GLTF specification. It's not public yet. The last time I checked it this morning, but even if it, it's not, we have an, a notion of what nodes are going to be there so we can already start implementing them and adjust them when the specification is public. And we also want to work on optimization. Like currently, uh, if we have two different event nodes that listen to the same observable, they're creating uh, two observers. This can be optimized. And of course, we don't want to just have the blocks in code because you could just code in this case. We want to have a final or final objective is to have a visual editing tool like the NME or in the NGE. So for Babylon 7, we want to have all the code pieces in place. So having the, be not the behavior, the flow graph engine. And we want to have to be able to parse and serialize from GLTF. So you can bring your assets with the behavior defined. And then for Babylon 8, we want to have the visual editor done. Uh, here, I was going to put some examples, but I ended up not putting. But if you look into the PRs, into my PRs in the Babylon repo, there are some playgrounds with examples of the behaviors. Uh, okay, so this is something that we are uh, very excited to for the community to see and use and give their thoughts, their ideas, their suggestions, what's working, what's not working. So anything, please talk to us on GitHub or the forum, comment on the pull requests, send us a message on the forum, a, a smoke signal, anything. We are very happy to to talk with everyone. Amazing. And it's that. Amazing, amazing. I've got some, I've got some questions already, Carol. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> the, sure. Yep. Yeah. So, is this already sort of testable with, um, you know, a model that's been set up a certain way and on a certain branch of Babylon? Like, to what extent can we already? You mentioned some playgrounds. We can already go in and test some things out. Yeah, you can. If you go to master now, you can already uh, test some playgrounds. Uh, they don't. We don't have any kind of parsing from G GLTF, so you can't bring a GLTF with the behaviors ready, because any, with, I don't think any uh, place yet has the, this parsing and serialization, because the, the extension is still uh, very much like on progress. Yep. Uh, but you can, like, I have some examples where I click, a, I have a, a cube, and I click that cube and the cube changes color. I or I click a cube and the cube starts playing an animation. And, uh, and how did you create that cube? Is that a cube that you made like with Babylon the yeah, mesh muter, or is that a cube? The mesh muter. Real? But it could be a, a GLTF cube too. There is nothing that uh, says that has to be you just need to pass a mesh. So the yep. origin of the mesh is is uh, flexible. I see, I see. Cool. And my other question is, so I love the idea of sort of the visual 
editor because we leverage those from Babylon in our product. You know, like we kind of let people make their own shaders and make their own particle systems. And for that, we don't bother making our own user interface. We just point them to things like the node material editor. And in this case, we'd love to be able to point them to something like your visual editor. I, I want to make sure I understand things right. So thinking about the example of the door with, with the handle that you click on and then it animates, am I right that in your visual editor, you'd be able to like create that logic and then sort of like re-down, like resave the model so that that model it incorporated the logic that you set up with the editor? Yeah, yeah. This uh, this would be something uh, possible to do on the editor. Like the editor works would work very similar to the enemy and NGE, and the enemy doesn't save a mesh; it saves a, a node geometry. But I don't see why we couldn't add an option to either just save the the definition of the behavior, like we save snippets currently, or mm -hmm. save the complete model with the behavior. Mm. Yep. Okay. Gotcha. Oh, I, I can share my screen again and sure. show the playgrounds. So these are the latest one. Uh, I did the, the door opening example because every single t tutorial uh, of blueprints is a door opening. So I, I guess this is the standard of behavior. If your door is open, you're good. And this is the example. So here I'm just playing the, the an animation that I defined it, but I could have brought a GLTF asset with an animation already uh, in place and used that asset. Mm -hmm. Cool. This is super exciting. And have you heard about whether anyone else is you mentioned like interoperability a lot and have you heard about other tools like possibly integrating this as well it seems like babylon sort of on the bleeding edge of being ahead of this extension but do you know of uh you know blender or anything else that's thinking about this too yeah uh we are pretty much on the bleeding edge but uh i think i've heard that adobe he was doing something uh, Rena is going to the interactivity meeting, so he can talk about that too. Uh, if anyone else has uh, expressed interest, but yeah, there are other players, like big players, that are uh, working on that. Really cool. Thank you. Uh, I have another example here that is a kind of a little car with a semaphore. So I click, the animation starts playing, and I can press stop and the animation stops playing. And I can uh, also show like how the, the, the graph looks like. Like you ha here you have two separate uh, graphs. You have one graph that controls the semaphore and one graph that controls the car. And uh, here I'm using custom events. When I press the, the button, the green button, I send a, a go event to the car. When I press the red button, I press, I run, a, I send a stop event to the car. And the car uh, receives those events. And when uh, the events are received, it runs either the play animation block or the stop animation block. And I have a third example here. Uh, wait, is should be a different example. Yeah, this one is another button that I click. And every time I click, I'm using variables for this. So I get the value of the height of the sphere. I add one. I set the position of the sphere. And I set the variable so I can remember the position of the sphere. So every time the spheres go up and up and up, and you can see there are two spheres that are using the same graph uh, with uh, different contexts. I could also like have those contexts be slightly customizable. Maybe one sphere uh, goes up by more than another sphere. Uh, there are a lot of possibilities. Really cool. 
How do I stop sharing again? Uh, there's a little button at the top left of the screen, like a little red X. Oh, I see it. You got it. And just to be clear for everybody, the um, <clears throat> the core engine itself that Carol's building, the, the flow graph engine and support for the GLTF spec, is something that we want to introduce for Babylon 7. The node-based editorial system is going to come a little later, probably um, after 7, probably 8, but before the 8 is actually released. So just to kind of set a little bit of expectations about the roadmap, like we want you to be able to read and understand uh, the, the interactivity spec in Babylon soon, but the editing of it will come as a second step. Thank you, Carol, very much for sharing. That was awesome. Thank you for uh, inviting me to talk about it. It's a very exciting thing to work on. Agreed. OK, cool. Well, we have gone above our hour. I think that's a, that's a good sign, really. Like Most people just kind of stuck around because the content was so incredibly good. And I'm very excited for our next one. A friendly reminder, if you would like to present, uh, just reach out. I'm on the Babylon forums or the Frame Discord or just find me on email. Uh, I'm just Gabe at FrameVR.io. Uh, as mentioned, we're going to be setting up the space a little bit fancier for the next one. And uh, would love if any of you would contribute any shaders to this effort. I'll put more details about this on the Babylon forum and all the other places I just mentioned. Um, so yeah, thank you all for coming. You're welcome to hang out for a little chill after party here and uh, looking forward to seeing you all next month. Nice. Great presentations, hey, everyone. Gabe, I found the laser pointer. <laughs> yeah. Just, I'm using it for good only. Can only for good. Just for Jason. <laughs> only, for, only for good. I'm using it for good. <laughs> yeah, we need granular I can't laser see you me. I want to have laser eyes. <laughs> Is this a standoff? <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> oh, I love this community. <laughs> yeah, I love.